<laughs> wow. Two in Greece. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> and now it's my honor to welcome the Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis. begin with our fireside chat. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I am told this is your first time speaking in this historic venue, and I thought maybe you could say a few words as to what this space means. We have many visitors, and I'd love you to speak to where we're sitting today before we start our conversation. Well, I guess I wouldn't be performing here ever. <laughs> but uh, indeed, I never, I, never, I never imagined that I would be sitting uh, on this stage. And first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, uh, Endeavour Greece uh, on its uh, splendid achievements uh, over the past decade. I think what you've uh, um, done here in Greece has been remarkable. We'll have an opportunity to talk more uh, about it during the, the discussion, but uh, I could not imagine uh, a better place uh, uh, under the Acropolis to have this uh, event uh, to celebrate not just the achievements of Endeavour, but also the achievements uh, of all the high impact entrepreneurs you have uh, uh, supported uh, and who are really contributing towards turning uh, this country around. So this is uh, obviously a, a very special place, you know, in, in the shadow of the Acropolis, uh, uh, a, a theater that uh, was uh, built uh, essentially 2000 uh, years ago, it was actually covered at the time it was built. Not many people know that. It had a, a, a wooden roof, uh, but it is one of the most special places where one can perform. And one should not forget, as we have also Ted in our company, that the performing arts were essentially born um, uh, right around the corner in the you know, ancient uh, theater uh, under the Acropolis uh, when ancient Greeks for the first time uh, experimented uh, uh, with, uh, with theater. Uh, as a form of uh, entertainment, but also as a form of self-reflection um, uh, for a society that ended up being the first democratic society uh, ever in uh, history. So I could not uh, imagine a better place uh, to be, and I'm sure that uh, our guests, especially those who visit us from uh, abroad, will enjoy this evening. Yeah. Ted, we had the pleasure of meeting last night, yeah. and I've been fascinated by your personal story, which in many ways epitomizes the American dream. You grew up in Phoenix to a lower middle class Greek American household. Your dad was an electrician. You got your first job as a video store clerk <laughs> and wound up as one of the most prominent people in the planet in global <laughs> entertainment. Um, and it's on to me that the business part of your life is fairly well known, but I'd love to know more about that Greek part of your life. You know, how did your family end up in America? What impact has your heritage had on you? And specifically, did you learn anything from your background that helps you today as a leader? So I, uh, first of all, I'm, my breath is taken away from where we're sitting right now, right this second. I don't think it's a coincidence or um, incidental or a piece of trivia um, that I do what I do, that I'm here tonight, and that my grandfather was born in Samos, Greece. Samos, Greece. Mm -hmm. Samos is Greek. <laughs> so we're Greek from Samos. And he, uh, I, I say that because um, of what the prime minister just said, re just over this so on the other side of this, uh, the whole idea, big ideas were born. Think, critical thinking, they had to thinking about drama. And, and those discussions 2,500 years ago about when thinking about what a great society might be uh, took drama and storytelling into incredible consideration. Uh, when Aristotle writes about it in Poetics, he tries to make some sense of what the rules of storytelling might be, um, which tells you how important it was already that long ago. And those very arguments 
uh, those very debates I have every day uh, about what is storytelling, what is art, what is cinema. Um, all those debates that continue to, to this very date, are, is it going to be defined by distribution? Is it going to be defined by the written form versus the, how it's performed? And all of those debates. And I have those discussions and I have those debates with the curiosity and the passion of a Greek. And that's, that's why that heritage is important to me and why it's, it's in my blood and in my bones uh, when I do what I do every day, which is always about storytelling and advancing the art of storytelling. Uh, and so that's, that is, I think, the impact of my Greek heritage. Um, I, I would learn a word last night. I don't speak Greek. I apologize. Uh, soya, which I just love the sound of that, uh, but which is you know, in my heritage. It's something where I knew as soon as I get off the plane here that I'm home. Um, wow. Yeah. That's wonderful. I love that. And, and the journey of my, my grandfather to America was a classic in that he was a very young man, son of a farmer. Uh, who, who I'm sure uh, 120 years ago would not have been contemplated that someday his grandson would be sitting next to, next to the prime minister, uh, <laughs> but uh, left home at a very young age um, with his head full of stories of cowboy books that he would read and went to America because he thought he might be a trail cook. He thought that was a real job in America uh, when he went to America and they changed the name from, uh, uh, he's Alex Karyatakis, but changed his name from Karyatakis to Sarandos when he came to America. That's great. See, now we have a piece of trivia, if you ever yes. want to know. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, we go way back. Uh, we met uh, in Harvard College as fellow social studies majors. And I remember back to our 18-year-old conversations when even with your family's history and politics, you were determined to go into the private sector. And you not only joined the private sector, you led the creation of Greece's first venture capital fund. So my question to you is, how and why did you start that pioneering VC fund? The entrepreneurs in our audience will love to know. And what role does your private sector experience have on your role as a public leader? Well, um, yes, we, uh, we, we, we do go you know, uh, way back with, uh, with Linda. And I was actually probably there when the idea behind Endeavor was born. In, uh, in 1997, when we d discussed this uh, uh, this concept of you going to Latin America to launch what is becoming what has become a tremendously successful um, uh, uh, organization, uh, and uh, frankly, I also have to be you know very honest with the audience. Back you know in 2007, 2008, when I was you know helping out as an uh, as uh, as a member of your ISP panels, I told you you should bring Endeavor to Greece, and you said. No way. And then, you know, three years later, my wife comes and succeeds where I failed. So um, <laughs> thank you, Mareva, for getting this done. Right? <laughs> That's totally true. <laughs> but uh, it, it, indeed, my, when, I, when I graduated from business school, I was not thinking about uh, politics, although I came from a political family. I was disillusioned uh, at the time about the political situation in, in Greece, and I decided to build my career in the private sector, spent you know, a few years in consulting, and then returned to Greece to work for a venture capital company, and then joined the National Bank of Greece. And one of our projects was to set up the first uh, tech fund in Greece uh, uh, in, in 2000, and the first Greek uh, incubator uh, a year later. It was probably a, uh, an idea ahead of its, uh, ahead of its time. Uh, at the time, the uh, tech ecosystem simply did not exist in, uh, in Greece. And although the fund was uh, relatively successful, I'm really very happy about what has happened uh, in the tech uh, ecosystem uh, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years uh, later. What I learned from uh, my time in the private sector, especially in venture capital, is you know, uh, two things I'd say. First is to be, you know, these are valuable lessons in my daily job, is to be data-driven. Uh, and uh, to make sure that you ask uh, uh, the, the right questions uh, uh, and, and focus uh, on, uh, on, on real analysis to look you know, really deep into the complexities uh, of problems. Uh, and the second aspect, which I always find fascinating about venture capital, was the, the variety uh, and the sort of intellectual curiosity that you need to uh, examine companies that come from very different sectors. And I think this experience uh, of how the Greek economy was really functioning is quite useful when you have to deal with, you know, macro problems uh, at, uh, at my level. So, you know, as someone who 
uh, was uh, probably there way before all the funds that are currently active uh, in Greece established their presence. I'm you know, so happy about the fact that now we have an active venture capital um, scene uh, in, uh, in Greece, you know, many funds, you know, uh, great, you know, great teams uh, really supporting uh, Greek um, uh, companies, uh, and uh, it's uh, extremely uh, satisfying uh, for me to really observe how the venture capital system, ecosystem, uh, has matured. So that's the perfect segue to the next thing I want to discuss, which is innovation and building this culture of disruption. So beyond our own model, which we've discussed, Endeavor has researched what it takes to build ecosystems of innovation. And we've noticed a few key ingredients from quality education and mentorship, a culture of angel investing, which you mentioned, and celebration of success. But Mr. Prime Minister, you've mentioned that one of your key goals is to turn Greece into a hub of innovation. And you've likened this to Israel or Ireland, small places with big impact. Um, so why is this such an important goal of yours? And tell us some of the things you're doing to make this dream a reality. Well, we're also thinking big. Uh, and uh, I think it is important for a country such as Greece, which is coming out of a very, very difficult decade to be able to think big because I think we have certain natural comparative advantages which we had not leveraged in the past. First of all, we have amazing talent. We have great public universities, uh, you know, great you know, uh, graduates uh, uh, who I think are really striving um, to, to succeed and they would love to succeed in their own country. We have a, um, uh, a passionate diaspora that would like to contribute uh, to the success of the country. We have 500,000 Greeks talented Greeks who left the country during the very difficult decade who would love to, um, uh, to come back um, uh, to, um, uh, to Greece. We have a market that is big enough uh, uh, to um, uh, test ideas. Uh, we, are, we sit at the crossroads of, of three continents, so we can be uh, an excellent uh, regional hub for companies that want to uh, expand uh, their, uh, their activities. So we just looked at what other countries uh, have done, uh, and uh, we try to uh, replicate uh, their success in terms of providing the right tax incentives uh, um, uh, for investments in R&D, making sure we uh, make it easier for people to return to Greece, uh, uh, setting up uh, you know, a, a dedicated platform, uh, which we call Elevate Greece, that for the first time um, uh, really um, uh, makes sure that we have a central database of all the companies that are active in the entrepreneurial space, and of course, also reforming our higher education. We just, we will pass uh, tomorrow a landmark legislation that is really freeing up our universities to partner with the private sector. Uh, and- uh, Tomorrow? To, uh, it's actually tomorrow, yeah. Wow. It'll, be, it'll, it'll be voted into law tomorrow and uh, we're very proud about it. So allowing, uh, you know, universities to set up their own uh, incubators, making sure that they can set up, you know, joint degrees, setting up uh, what we call an internal Erasmus program, which is a replicate of the European program. So you can take a semester uh, and study at another university in a discipline that is completely different from what you uh, are, uh, are majoring in. All these are big revolutions for our uh, universities. But if I look at the interest in terms of partnering uh, with American universities and what Greek universities have to uh, offer, I think we are on a very, very good path uh, to really change the way our higher education system uh, is, uh, uh, is working. And, and last but not least, uh, what we realized uh, during COVID was that uh, people are happy to work from anywhere. So if you can work from anywhere, wouldn't you love to work from Greece? Uh, and uh, <laughs> as long as you have uh, you know, good, uh, good connectivity, uh, Greece is a lovely country, it's a safe um, um, uh, country, and what we actually see is that we have um, many sort of digital nomads who are taking advantage also of the incentives we've put in place who are actually working from Greece. And I think in their own way, they're contributing to this uh, uh, booming uh, ecosystem. So uh, again, we want to, we want to be disruptors. Uh, what, when you think about entrepreneurship, it's, it's not a linear process. You can actually see you know, big jumps uh, and uh, um, uh, sort of uh, exponential growth. Uh, and the last point I want to make is that we also want to introduce this, this culture of innovation into the public sector, which is a huge challenge. But if you look at what we have achieved in terms of digitizing the state, 
uh, it is generally appreciated as something which is close to a revolution, the ability to essentially interact with, with a state from your mobile phone through our gov.gr application or your PC. These things were unheard of in Greece. So the state is also uh, uh, innovating, and of course the state is also engaged in big procurement. Uh, and we want to make sure that whatever we do uh, in terms of uh, technology is state of the art, and we want to use also the, you know, the cutting edge uh, Greek startups to support us uh, in transforming the way the Greek state is operating. Wow. I think there's a lot of people from these other countries who <laughs> wish their, their, their leaders in their countries had as good an answer to that question as you did. <laughs> Certainly I do. <laughs> uh, turning to you, Ted. You live in Hollywood, one of the most creative places on earth, and you lead one of the most innovative companies in a rapidly changing space. So I'd love to hear from you some do's and don'ts for how to build this disruptive, innovative culture within a company. Well, I, look, I think um, innovation thrives in freedom, and innovation thrives, thrives when you have a lot of empowered people and the willingness to try new things. Um, the things you said about uh, celebrating victories are very important, and I think exploring failures are incredibly important, uh, and have a culture that can talk about both with equal vigor uh, so that you can learn from each other and learn from things. Um, I think when you get to a place where people generally want to join Netflix because we historically, Reed Hastings, the founder of the company, uh, wrote a, a, a culture document that basically laid out what this company might look like someday. And we started talking about, the, he and I started talking about that document in 1999, the concepts that are in that document. And they were you know, pretty lofty goals for a company with 100 people back then. Uh, and when you talk, but, but the ideas in there around um, basically finding the best people in the world, give them the resources to do the best work of their life and then get out of their way and not give them a lot of structure and not give them a lot of rules. And then you will attract those kind of people and they will innovate. Uh, if you have a big culture with a, a lot of rules and rigor, uh, you generally attract people who are more comfortable in that way, and their goals are not really to break rules and to innovate and to break and break through. Uh, it's mostly some a comfort level that people generally don't have when they work at Netflix, where the idea is they can say, look, I'm the best at what I do, and I want to work there so I could show you. And I think that is that you have to foster that environment always. And I, sometimes you could do it internally, which is really important, uh, but it's also about the pe just like when you pick the people you want to work with, uh, inside the company, you pick the people and the places you want to work outside of the company that fit that really nicely. Um, to the great credit of the Prime Minister, the, the incentive to bring production to Greece. It's in its infancy, but it's remarkable, and it's been it's very incredibly effective uh, to bringing uh, film production and television production to Greece, and I think both tell, tell, telling Greek stories to the world, but also uh, coming here to make films for the world. Uh, and I think that's just the beginning of what you're, what you're up to, and being able to look at um, forward looking as far as this has been, because it's gonna be a few years as this comes together, but it's gonna get better and bigger every year. The same way when we had these big idea discussions in 1999, uh, it wasn't clear you needed it for 100 people, but we sure need it today with 10,000 people. Great, so I wanna turn to the moment we're in today, and you know, everyone in this room, no matter where they work, is dealing with headwinds and challenges from yeah. you know, COVID to the capital markets, to war, to inflation, to the talent issues. And, you know, especially if you're leading a business or an organization, yeah. you're in uncharted waters and making difficult decisions every day. So what, you know, I've been leading these conversations we call leading through crisis, who's hosting these webinars yeah. uh, since COVID. And one thing keeps coming up over and over, which is how do you maintain that culture of innovation you were just discussing, that forward looking, positive, you know, uh, internal way of doing things when you have to deliver bad news, when you have to pivot your strategy, when you have some destabilizing events. I'd love to hear your thoughts, and there are a lot of entrepreneurs out here who would love to, to learn from your example. Sure, I, look, I think the um, being there and showing up when the news is good and being there is easy, and then being there and showing up when the news is bad is important. And it's really important to talk people through the implications of it so they're not feeling around in the dark when things feel a little unstable. And the, our business changes. Um, you, you've said our industry is you know, in flux. Um, I've seen our business go 
from hills and valleys that you would not believe in 20 years as a public company. Uh, when I look at that, though, and I look back at, you know, I think young people think of the world in, uh, of success like always straight up and to the right. And as you know, as you get look further into the cycle and look backwards, it was really a, hill, a bunch of failures and successes and hills and valleys and peaks and valleys. Uh, and you have to remind people all the time that um, remember when things were not so great? And you have to do that sometimes when things are really great. Uh, and often sometimes we forget to look back and remember uh, the tougher times when things are good. You get too comfortable in that. Uh, and, but, but I think that to, to survive and to thrive and to grow, you have to be as strong a team in failure as you are in success. So when things are down, there can't be finger pointing. There can't be uh, all, uh, a bunch of different ideas of why. Uh, you have to have a, a common narrative about what, we're gonna, what, what you're going to do change, to change it and turn that around. And I've, having come through several cycles of that in the entertainment business, uh, for us, remember, I've, since we started this, we've seen formats come and go, you know, DVD, VHS, uh, pay television, the rise and the, the decline of pay television, satellite TV, all these things have really kind of in the course of the lifetime of Netflix uh, have kind of run through these cycles. So of course, it's not gonna be steady. We're not, it's not, and I think you have to constantly, I think, root people in history, uh, in the history of your own company sometimes, so that people know that not to expect steadiness. They're gonna be very disappointed if it's gonna be expecting steadiness. <laughs> So, thank you. And, yeah. That was and you, great. By the way, in, in, to ask the, <laughs> you asked the question in Greece, by the way, and I got, you know, crisis, you said earlier from your podcast, but that's a Greek word, right? And, and I was taught that this is uh, a crisis, and the, the verb for that is, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, but uh, krino, right? Krino? Mm -hmm. Which is not panic, it's decide. It's, so it's all about crisis. And ah. Crisis is the word don't, not only tells you what it is, it tells you what to do. Decide. <laughs> Make a decision. Uh, that is uh, great. Greeno? Greeno? Greeno. Did I get that right? Decide yeah. or judge, yeah. 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 Decide, decide. <laughs> big, from the uh, land of big thinking. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a similar question to you. We talked about one of your platforms of your big agenda. How, how do you stay focused on this grand agenda you have when you're forced to reckon with so many events outside of your control? And what, and what lessons do, can you give to others who are not in your position but could learn? It's, um, it's certainly a challenge, but I think what you, what, what you learn uh, um, in, in my position is that you have to be able to deal with the unpredictable and manage crisis, um, which is a short term challenge while at the same time maintaining the focus on the long-term transformation um, that you have set out to implement. Uh, and that is, it, it is not easy. A lot of it is about compartmentalizing and about proper um, uh, time um, uh, management uh, and about making sure that uh, you have also people with your team, within your team who can think beyond dealing with the next, uh, uh, next crisis. And of course, when you also deal with a crisis, Look at how you can turn you know, what, is, what can be a very painful and difficult situation uh, into an opportunity. For example, when, when COVID struck uh, in Greece, we had to take incredibly painful decisions as you know, most governments. We were one of the first governments to decide to shut down the country very early and that essentially saved us from the first very, very difficult uh, COVID wave. But when we designed our, uh, our vaccine program, we said, look, this is an opportunity to go fully digital. So when my, when my daughter came back uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from the US and she showed me her vaccine certificate, which was a little handwritten card, I said, what is this? I mean, <laughs> we, this doesn't exist in Greece. <laughs> Everything is digital. So we, we, we used the crisis <laughs> to drive through and, uh, and accelerate uh, the digital uh, transformation. So when we are now, we now have the capability, when we look at, you know, how, how do you support people um, uh, during, uh, during these very painful times, we actually have the capability of delivering targeted support that is means tested, and we do it digitally. Had we not had these digital tools, we would not have been in a position to implement these focused uh, initiatives regarding uh, our, uh, our public policies. So uh, I think we, uh, we need to be able to do both, think long term and make, make sure that you stay focused uh, on what your, uh, your big transformation plan is for the country. But of course, uh, 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 moving from crisis to, um, uh, to crisis 
uh, you become also more experienced in dealing with these, uh, with these crises in terms of how do you communicate. You have to be uh, brutally uh, honest. You have to be open and willing to recognize your mistakes. You have to tell people that sometimes you have to reach you know, decisions with imperfect um, uh, information. And it is, it is difficult because everywhere you know, in the world, uh, you know, governments have to fight you know, the, sort of, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the ghosts of populism. Uh, there's always someone who's going to suggest that there are easy solutions to complicated problems as if they have a printing machine uh, that can uh, you know, spend money uh, uh, like there is no, no tomorrow. But because Greece has actually gone through lots of um, phases, we've experimented with, uh, with populism, it didn't turn out uh, very, very well. Uh, I have a lot of faith um, uh, in, uh, in people and in the uh, sort of honesty uh, of the uh, interaction. And I do believe that when you tell people the, uh, the truth and you explain to them what it is you try um, to do, what the difficulties really are, what are the challenges ahead. However, you need to maintain a degree of optimism that we can actually um, uh, overcome these crises, uh, you can uh, actually uh, muster a lot of uh, public support. And uh, we're also sort of in the, in the business of, uh, uh, of, uh, of storytelling uh, in the sense that we need to be inspired from, uh, from history and from our you know, sort of historical um, uh, lessons. Uh, we celebrated our 200 years uh, of uh, independence, uh, of the beginning of the War of Independence uh, last year. And if you look at the patterns of Greek history, it has been a sequence uh, of a country that has done extraordinary things and has faced, you know, grave crises and even catastrophes. But every time we ended up better. So the trajectory overall has been, uh, has been um, uh, positive. Uh, so that's how I like to, um, uh, to look at things uh, so that we don't all get uh, too depressed <laughs> when, when, when we have to deal with, uh, you know, with a, with a crisis after uh, uh, an, another crisis. But this is the, the, the reality today. Uh, uh, when, you, when you want to uh, enter public service, you have to be ready for, the, uh, for that. And who can be depressed in locations like these, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I want to turn to how the world today is almost reshaping the dynamics between the public and the private sector. So if I were to have polled entrepreneurs and CEOs up until recently and asked them the number one role of government, I think for many the answer would have been stay out of the way, do no harm. But with all of the large scale issues you're, you've, we've been discussing, that's no longer possible for the private sector to wall itself off from the public sector. So I'd love you to give us kind of a behind the scenes, inside look as to what are the conversations you've been having recently with, with government officials, with business leaders, and how have these recent conversations changed perhaps from the ones you were having five years ago? Oh, they have changed a lot. Uh, and uh, maybe five years ago, we would be more sort of uh, involved in discussions regarding sort of the size of the state and the ability to sort of free the private sector and let it do its own things. I think the one thing we learned during the, uh, during the pandemic is that uh, when, when you are facing the crisis, a state needs to step in uh, and uh, really needs to be able to, uh, to intervene in a manner that, is, that was inconceivable uh, three or four years uh, ago. So we spent more than 40 billion supporting the Greek economy uh, during COVID, and our main focus uh, was to, 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 save, to save jobs. And we worked with the private sector to find the appropriate schemes and to offer uh, the private sector the flexibility to be able to retain workers. So let me give you an example. You all know about the mess with airports in, uh, you know, in many European um, uh, countries. Um, we don't have the same problem here. Hmm. One of the reasons why we don't have the same problem here is because we put in place a temporary work schemes where we essentially allowed companies to employ their employees for 50 or even 30% of their time, but we covered the difference. So the companies did not fire their employees. The employees stayed on the payroll. So when the demand picked up, the people were there. You didn't have to go back to, to rehire them uh, from the beginning. So this is an example of what was a very successful uh, public policy initiative, which we discussed with, uh, uh, with the private sector. But uh, uh, given the, the challenges that we're facing, uh, you need a, a state that is effective uh, and interventionist whenever that needs to happen. And uh, uh, frankly, there are also 
um, uh, cases where uh, markets are clearly failing. Uh, for example, if you look at you know, the gas market today in Europe, it's a failing market. It does not reflect the forces of supply uh, and demand. And you need to be able to step in at the national level or at the European level. In Europe, we did something two years ago which was sort of, which would have been, again, inconceivable three years ago. We borrowed as a supranational entity 750 billion euros, and we gave it to the member states, we distributed it to the member states, um, uh, through grants but also loans to support the economic recovery. So in Greece now we have almost 30 billion euros of additional funds that we can channel um, towards reforms and investments in the post-COVID uh, uh, era. So uh, this, uh, this public money is uh, not crowding out private investment. If anything, it is leveraging more private investment to, in, to invest in the growth potential uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the country. So, yeah, the, the long gone are the days uh, when uh, we, we thought that we just ha had to have government you know, get out of the way. Um, uh, it doesn't work uh, that way. Uh, you need an effective um, uh, government and you actually have the ability to drive through um, uh, public policy initiatives that can actually make uh, a, a, a big difference. Uh, so the private sector, no, it's, it's not going to solve all the world's <laughs> problems. That's, that's for sure. But you also need to strongly cooperate um, with the non-profit sector. We've done that uh, in Greece uh, uh, on, uh, on, on numerous uh, occasions. And uh, a lot of the changes that we drive through um, have to be reflected also in, in, in people taking their own initiatives uh, and, and making sure that we have uh, uh, ample support for those grassroots initiatives that you know, are bottom up. We're top down, but we need to make sure that uh, we also foster bottom-up uh, uh, change uh, uh, from, uh, from society at the local or the regional level. Great. So, Ted, uh, a related question to you. I think, um, again, up until recently, if I were to ask most of our entrepreneurs or other CEOs, what's your role and stance on public issues? They would say, I have none. I'm a visionary or a product person or a creative person. My job is to stay out of the way. And again, especially with things being so charged, employees and stakeholders are demanding that their leaders speak out and act on some of our social and political issues of the day. And yeah. I get a call now daily from our entrepreneurs saying, what do I do? Am I supposed to speak up? How, how do I respond? So I'd love to hear your experience navigating these recent uh, yeah. uh, sort of changes and any advice you have for entrepreneurs facing similar issues. Well, it could, it's probably the most complex issue facing CEO, CEOs today around these issues because uh, all of these issues are incredibly polarizing. Um, not just polarizing in the world, but even polarizing in the workplace. So when I think when a CEO or a founder decides they want to speak uh, in the royal we, they got to be making sure they really represent the whole we, and they might not be. Mm. Um, so I think, so that's why I think it is probably the better role, which is to focus on, on the work that we're doing, the product that we're doing, the vision that we're trying to execute. Our storytelling is very effective in moving some of these issues um, and, and how they work through society. Our tweets probably are not. Uh, the, the work, <laughs> so the, and, and I think um, a statement without a real action is probably, it, it might feel good for a second, but it really doesn't change the outcome. And we're really not capable of too many actions in local law, let alone international law in other countries. So uh, in general, I really try to stay focused on the things that face our industry and our business, empower our people, and hope that they use the, the fruits of their work at Netflix to go out and make the world a better place in, their, in the way that they see it to be. And if, though, some your employees sort of demand, say it's not enough, like how do, you, how do you respond if they're saying, hey, wait a minute, in our country, you know, the Supreme Court decision came down or some statement needs to be had or it doesn't represent me as an employee. How, do you, how are you handling that? It's challenging. Yeah, I, I, again, I think being up front with, your, with, the, with employees so they understand what the expectation is up front, what you plan to do, what you would do, what you will do. Uh, that way that they, they are not, not disappointed. We recently went through one of these very, very publicly uh, around the uh, freedom of free expression and stand-up comedy, and, uh, and it wasn't 100% unanimous for sure. Uh, but what we had, did was we crafted a, a, a position, and we sent it around to all of our employees, and we said, feel free to comment on this document, and we'll craft this together. 
And we spent a couple of months with all, all of 10,000 employees uh, inputting <laughs> into this document until it represented our position uh, that we could go forward with so that we knew we wouldn't have to deal with this every single time there was uh, a comedian that you didn't agree with their position, uh, that where we would, you know, what we were here for. We are here to entertain the world. That is our job. And if we do it really well, then we'll be able to help make the world a better place. But being able to, but, but if you're just going to take a polarizing position and just throw out a, a position on it without any action, you're just throwing fuel on the fire. You're really not helping in the position. Wonderful. So let's turn to the Greek diaspora. You can come. Yes. <laughs> As you heard earlier, our Endeavor Greece team has come out with this fascinating report on the state of the local tech ecosystem here in Greece. And they've included a study of startups founded by Greeks outside. Um, and in fact, you correctly mentioned that it was Mareva who first uh, got me to agree <laughs> to launch Endeavor in Europe starting in Greece. Uh, <laughs> it was also Costanza who convinced me that yes, we should allow Greek diaspora to apply as candidates to Endeavor's international selection panels until they become Endeavor entrepreneurs. Uh, this is now our policy worldwide. Proof that if you need anything done, it has to start with a request by a Greek woman. <laughs> <laughs> One takeaway. Uh, so um, I want to give you the opportunity. We have uh, many uh, Greek diaspora here in this audience. We have Ted right here. I mean, what more? You mentioned a lot of things you were doing, which is wonderful, but what would you hope from them? How can this community contribute even more to build on this incredible momentum we're seeing uh, in terms of this innovation ecosystem we've been talking about here in Greece? It's very simple. You have to believe in the potential of the country and be willing to contribute to its uh, success. And uh, it's, it's happening. Uh, for the first time, we really see the, the Greek uh, diaspora actively engaged uh, in, uh, in Greek affairs, uh, investing more in Greece, be willing to spend uh, more time, uh, in your case also, you know, mentoring new entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, and we have phenomenally successful um, uh, Greeks abroad, uh, you know, in Silicon uh, Valley, you know, in, in, in Hollywood, we have a few of them, you know, um, uh, with, uh, with us today. But, uh, uh, it has to, we have to make it worth your time because in the past we've had these discussions before and then they didn't lead to anything uh, of substance. So we, we have to respect that th th these people are busy people. Uh, they would like to contribute to the success of the country, but the preconditions have to be there. So we want to make sure that we lay the groundwork uh, in order for this interaction to actually uh, happen. And. Uh, uh, the fact that the country has broken out of this sort of vicious cycle um, of, uh, uh, of recessions uh, and constant uh, crisis and is really uh, aiming high is also um, uh, equipping those who want to contribute to Greece with much more uh, optimism. So when you come in and visit Greece uh, and you compare it to where the country was three or five years ago, you really get the sense that the country is moving in the right direction, and this is generating more sort of positive momentum and more uh, willingness to, to interact uh, and, to, uh, and to contribute. And frankly, for us, uh, it's also uh, an opportunity to leverage uh, you know, the, the expertise that exists outside Greece. I mean, when we, for example, want to see uh, how we can uh, uh, support audiovisual production or the creative arts. Uh, we talk to people like Ted and ask him, I mean, what more uh, can, we, uh, can we do during you know, COVID? Uh, for example, you know, the CEO of Pfizer is, uh, uh, is, is, is a proud Greek uh, uh, from Thessaloniki. Uh, and uh, uh, he actually not only you know, helped us with, uh, with uh, helping us understand what is a very complicated situation, but he also took the decision um, uh, to set up uh, an AI uh, center in, in Thessaloniki, and he started with uh, hiring 300 people. He's at 700 people now, and he wants to go to 1,100 people in the next couple of years. And why is he doing it? Not just because he's Greek, 
I don't think the Pfizer board would, would accept that. Uh, uh, he's, he's doing it uh, because he convinced the board that there is enough talent in Greece to make it worthwhile for companies such as Pfizer um, uh, to actually uh, invest uh, in, in Greece. So I think the potential uh, is there. The, the networks are being, uh, are being built. And this, again, this, is, this will not be sort of a top-down controlled uh, exercise. It doesn't happen that way. Networks are not built. Um, uh, that way, but you know, I'm happy to see many people I know from the uh, from the diaspora actively engaged in Greek affairs. Uh, we want their contribution also when it comes to participating in public entity boards. Uh, 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 we value their contribution, we value their uh, their time, and we want them to be part of the uh, success uh, of, of the country. And I'm sure that they also, looking at Greece from abroad, maybe they have a clearer view of what's really happening uh, uh, in Greece. Uh, you know, the politics are less polarized when you look at Greece from, from abroad, uh, and uh, this is what the diaspora can really uh, contribute uh, uh, to Greece. So come back, uh, uh, not, not just for your holidays, uh, you know, <laughs> make sure you, you invest more in, um, uh, in Greece and be part of the Greek uh, success. It's an easier pitch today than it was three years ago. <laughs> That got a big response. <laughs> okay, so, so you're here now. You've also shot movies in yeah. Greece, including Beckett, which was the first fully Netflix-produced movie, True. filmed movie in Greece. But when we were talking, Ted, you mentioned that it would take a large invest, scale investment to do what the Prime Minister was talking about, to make Greece this audiovisual entertainment production hub. So tell us, you know, what more needs to be done to make this happen, and maybe we can make some more news today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should say, if you're going to speak of the diaspora and, and as a resource for Greece, you couldn't look any further than one of the great Greek Americans, one of the great Greek Californians, and one of the most accomplished uh, Greeks uh, in the entertainment business ever, Jim Giannopoulos, who I see him sitting right there. So tell us about the power of having... Uh, an unofficial ambassador in California and in the entertainment business, uh, and his lovely wife, Anne. Hello, Anne. Um, so I would say, look, we, we've filmed about 10 in the last, over the last couple of years, uh, 10 different projects uh, in Greece. Um, uh, Beckett was the first of our original films we fully produced in, in Greece. Uh, we also filmed a big piece of uh, Knives Out 2, which is our biggest film coming up this year um, here in Sepsis, oh. and it was an unbelievable experience for everybody. It was also during covid and uh, what the Prime Minister said is 100% true around trying to figure out ways to work uh, at that time that were safe and effective and in partnership with government to make sure you can get production done. It was really remarkable, not just uh, that, those films for us, but uh, we also uh, distributed around the world the Oscar-nominated film uh, um, uh, Lost Daughter that was all filmed in sepsis, and all, including the New York flashback scenes were all filmed in Greece. Um, and the, it was, I can tell you uh, the first experience is this is a very e easier place to work than many places, uh, thanks to the, all the things he just said. Uh, it's lacking a little bit of infrastructure in terms of getting to the scale that we would like to get to, but that takes time and it takes attracting the production to come in and bring it with you, and then it stays behind. So every time you attract a new film to Greece, the whole system, the whole ecosystem gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So um, these, you know, uh, sound stages, uh, some entrepreneur uh, would probably want to invest in sound stages as we're attracting more production degrees. Um, training crews. Th there's a lot of technical jobs for, I think, on, uh, on Knives Out 2, I think we had close to 400 people on that crew. Um, so those are, those are a lot of folks who need the experience of working on a film set uh, to do some work like carpentry and electrician and grips and... Uh, but also the cinematography work and all these things. And, and, they're all, and that will also lead to great uh, tech jobs like in post-production, animation, uh, all those things that the whole ecosystem builds on every project. So you have to take it one step at a time. And uh, uh, the Greek government has done a wonderful job of attract, making it this an attractive place to be in a very competitive world. So that's probably the, the it's mostly uh, good brings more good. Good brings more good.
Anything you'd like to add or respond to? Well, we had this discussion with... Uh, with uh, yeah, well, we, we want the inside scoop. What's yeah, happening? we had this discussion <laughs> today, and I said I'd be really, really happy when, we find, when, we, when we're going to have the first, you know, Greek-speaking show doing really yeah. well on Netflix. Maybe yeah. it has already been filmed, yeah. uh, and I think it is, it is important for you know, a company like Netflix to really be aware of the fact that there's a lot of creativity yeah. when it comes to um, uh, uh, Greek uh, productions, uh, especially our TV shows, I think are you know, excellent. And what Netflix has demonstrated is that there are you know, global stories regardless of the language in which uh, these, uh, these shows are, uh, are produced. This is you know, the beauty of this uh, um, uh, uh, platform. Uh, so why not have uh, you know, a Greek uh, uh, blockbuster on, uh, uh, on, on Netflix and make sure also, I think I took very much note of what you said, that there are many new jobs that can be created um, um, uh, around, uh, uh, around film um, uh, production. And as we think also a lot about technical education and not just about uh, sending everyone in Greece to a university, uh, yeah. These uh, skills, which uh, w w can be acquired relatively, relatively quickly, could lead to very, well, very good, uh, you know, uh, jobs that pay actually uh, quite well and that are also uh, fascinating and very creative. And then, when I, of course, try to pitch Greece to, uh, to Ted, you know, the obvious, uh, you know, pitch is very simple: Who would not like to, you know, shoot in Greece uh, in terms of international <laughs> actors? We've had so many celebrities. Uh, come to Greece they immediately. Say um, yes. uh, this uh, uh, this year, uh, they were very kind in terms of uh, tweeting or sharing their uh, stories on uh, on Instagram. Williams so again, today. the you know the the, yeah. the pitch yeah. that you know it's Greece is a great place to work from also very much applies to um, uh, uh, to production. Plus, it's a country that has not been sort of aggressively filmed. So there's still lots of lots of scenery that is completely pristine. New for views, uh, that right? is completely new. So um, uh, there's much more to do on that front in Greece. Yeah, and for Greek, also uh, being able to advance Greek stories that are already out there. We've uh, just added Waiter to Netflix around the world. We just, we're just we about to add uh, Green Sea is coming up. Uh, and then we are, I'll tell you, I can't tell you what exactly, but we are talking to one of the uh, television partners here in Greece about taking a very, very big Greek show and, and getting it out to the world uh, the way we did with La Casa de Papel from Spain and all that. So uh, that is absolutely just around the corner. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And you had, to, you had to think how unlikely it is that the, some of the biggest stories in the world on Netflix have come from Korea, from France, <laughs> from Spain. Yeah. And I'm sure they're going to come from Greece. I'm sure they're going to come from Greece. Yeah. Okay. I, I have one final question for each of you. But before we get to that, <laughs> we are going to have some fun. Because I have eight lightning round questions that no one has seen. <laughs> Neither of the speakers know what's coming. And this, this is, is never good. This is never good. <laughs> this is what you get when you invite <laughs> Chica Loca, the crazy girl, to be here. <laughs> so, our first four questions are about the modern world. Mr. Prime Minister, favorite Netflix show? Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> um, Homeland. Okay. Um, now, I he didn't know it was part of the lightning show. round, but <laughs> he didn't know that it was part of the lightning round, but Ted and I had a bet on this, and we think it's Emily in Paris. That's my wife's favorite show. Ah. <laughs> That's no, actually, uh, to use be, the wife. To be, no. very, to be very honest, this is exactly what I need when I come home after a tough day at the office. Emily in Paris, there I, we go. I, I, I would prefer Emily in Paris. Uh, I would pick Emily in Paris over Borgen. <laughs> at any time. Okay, Ted. Ted, same yes. question. Got to pick and choose. I, that for me is picking children. It's very difficult yeah, to do okay. that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Well, if you can either go there or just between friends, among friends, or you can pick your favorite non-Netflix show then. Well, uh, <laughs> there are none. <laughs> yeah, I tell, well, it's got a little bit of history to it. I, with the reason why House of Cards became our first Netflix original show was um, when we first heard the pitch, one of my favorite shows ever was the original House of Cards from the BBC that I had watched on DVD 10 times before. And that, so that always has a special place for me. So that's a, it's actually, a, the original was a BBC, and of course the, the uh, Netflix, uh, I think we upgraded it a little bit. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ted, favorite movie set in Greece? 
Oh. I, this is, well, it's a really hard question. Um, I told I, you they Well, I'm just, out. I'm going to say it. It's Knives Out 2. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Favorite movie set in Greece? Hmm. What was this James Bond movie that was filmed in Meteora? Um, uh, that was... Uh, Ask him. Uh, uh, <laughs> for your eyes only. For your, for eyes, for your only. eyes only. Okay. Some... Oh, okay. All right. Well... And Meteora and, and Corfu also. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wait, that's a quote from the... It was filmed there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, but did you just quote the film? The f For your eyes only. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I thought you were quoting. I thought he was looking for a job yeah. for a part. Testing out your acting skills. <laughs> um, those of you with teenage girls, I will say mine, uh, my girls and I just rewatched Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, partly set in ah, Santorini. Those, yeah. Highly recommend. Okay. Favorite Greek island cannot be Crete, where your family is from. That's easy. Tinos. <laughs> uh, favorite Greek island cannot be Samos, where your family is from. Mm. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see Antiparos. Uh, from Jim's description, it's already my favorite island. So. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So WhatsApp just this week enabled emoji reactions. Ted, favorite emoji? <laughs> <laughs> the one I use the most is I'm texting with my wife, the, our heart, the heart emoji. That's the most used emoji. Uh, the favorite one, I think, is just the one with the big eyes. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Prime Minister, the favorite that, the emoji? The one that's, you know, laughing with the tears the crying. Crying down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, now let's pivot to four questions about the past. Uh oh, this is what I did. Okay. <laughs> um, ancient Greek figure you'd most like to have dinner with? Aristotle. Uh, same. <laughs> Honestly, same, yeah. Now, the Prime Minister gets to go first, so you have to pick another one. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'll let you have the... Okay. Greek god or goddess you would choose to be? Zeus. <laughs> Greek god or goddess you would choose to be? Oh, I'll go with Poseidon. <laughs> Olympic sport you would compete in? Ancient Olympic sport or, or modern? Yeah. Take your pick. Oh, we're, it's about the past, Bad. but... Basketball, but I would never be any good at it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, swimming, but I'd also be not be very good at it. Okay. And last lightning round question. This Odeon was built 2,000 years ago. So what motto, idea, or saying of yours would you like to last 2,000 years? Mm. Well, it's um, one that I will steal from my father-in-law, Clarence Avon, who reminds me every day, nothing remains the same. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister? I'll skip that question. <laughs> That's my privilege. <laughs> okay, Prime Minister at privilege. I'll go with crazy as a compliment, so there. <laughs> All right, final big picture question. Um, Ted, let's start with you. So we've alluded to the power of storytelling tonight. We are in a venue that has seen some of the greatest storytellers on earth. Um, you said that you make all your employees read one book. I want you to remind people what that book is and why you choose it. And also, I'd love to get your view on the future of storytelling, both in the macro sense, but also on a micro level. Today, yeah. each of us have to be storytellers. So what advice, as part of your big idea, what advice do you give each of us about how to tell our own stories better? So I would say um, the book is, uh, and it's to, not to all employees, but it's to my, the creative executives uh, to read Poetics. And it's a very fast read, um, and, but, it's also, but it gives them a sense of a story structure, a place to start, and a place to start debate. So a place to way, to way to think about things. And, and, and the idea that these debates were happening 2,500 years ago remind us how important what we do is every day. So that's, that's why we have them read that book. And um, the, I'm sure what was the second part of the question? 
<laughs> no, your, your big macro uh, picture, future of storytelling, yeah. and then at a micro level, what each of us can do to tell our own stories yeah, better. Yeah, so storytelling, like being told a story, has been remarkably enduring over, the, over history. Through all kinds of technology, through all kinds of civilizations, uh, being told a story uh, is something that we thrive on, that human beings thrive on. Um, we learned this during the, pe the pandemic where I had uh, the great Guillermo del Toro call me one day and he said, you know, I'm, what I'm realizing is I need a lot more than food and water. I need stories. Mm. And I think that uh, it's something I'm very proud of, the role that Netflix played in this pandemic was being able to entertain the world and to get people through a very tough time. And those things are all you know, re remarkably important how, how those, those, those are. And I think if you think through the next phase, like when professional storytelling or linear storytelling or film storytelling or however you want to do it, uh, it's been pretty remarkable and people, how long it's lasted and with how it's lasted through every other kind of disruption and every other kind of um, uh, innovation. At the core, people are still telling stories and, being, and want to be told a story. So that we have created a new kind of creator ecosystem where a lot of people are making things on TikTok and making YouTube videos. And, and this is, that's a pretty exciting thing. And I always remind when I speak to film students in you know, high school and up that they are living in the most remarkable time in history for a storyteller. Because the tools to tell your story mm. have never been easier, cheaper, and more accessible than they are right this second. You probably, in your back pocket, have everything you need to tell your story to the entire world. And when has that ever been true up until right now? So this idea that people say, how do I tell my story? How do I get it made? How do I do this? How do I do that? Do it. If you are a writer, write. If you are a shooter, shoot. You know what I mean? Shoot, a, shoot make your film. Make it, on you, make it on your phone and load it up to social media and get it out to the world. And it, just you never know if it's going to catch fire. That's not a business, but that is creation that will lead to a business. So they, when it comes to telling stories, and do, the best thing to do is do it and know that, there's, know that for sure there's an audience there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, Prime Minister, um, as your friend, as a fan, and as an American, I was deeply moved by your speech to the joint sessions of Congress in the United States. And, yeah, Google it if you haven't. It's amazing. Um, and among other things, you gave this beautiful history lesson of the origins of democracy, which are so palpable here tonight. And so I'd love to hear your perspective as democracy feels so fragile today. What can each of us as citizens, as business leaders, as members of civil society do to protect our democratic ideals? And you know, what gives you hope? We, we all could use a little bit of hope, so I'd love you to end uh, this incredible evening on, on a message of optimism, which I know you always do. Well, democracy has proven to be resilient, but it also needs to change to adjust to the realities uh, of the 21st uh, century. But the story of uh, uh, you know, ancient Athenian democracy can be uh, inspiring in many different uh, uh, ways, because this was essentially the first experiment uh, you know, of uh, a community of people to govern um, uh, themselves uh, uh, without having to, to delegate that responsibility to uh, a tyrant or a ruler uh, or, or an emperor. But uh, the challenges that Athenian democracy faced at the time were still pretty similar to the ones we face today. Um, um, uh, populism, um, uh, the, um, the need to have a filter to moderate decisions, be sure that passions don't uh, you know, uh, uh, overrun the democratic discourse. Uh, a lot of these lessons of Athenian democracy are particularly uh, relevant um, uh, today. So I think the, fir the first thing is to make sure that we do participate in the democratic process. And uh, my, my advice to, uh, to young people is that don't you know, outsource this responsibility to somebody else because eventually somebody is going to make decisions and you don't want somebody else to make decisions on your behalf without you participating. And you know, participating in the democratic process is not just you know, voting every uh, four years. Uh, it is a more systematic uh, civic engagement. Uh, 
uh, making sure you uh, participate in issues that you, uh, that you care about, or even if you participate in social media interactions, make sure you do so um, uh, without uh, not hiding behind the anonymity um, uh, of social media, and, and make sure you try to, to avoid the, uh, the toxicity of the, of the public debate that is really uh, poisoning uh, our, uh, our democratic discourse. And democracy is about hearing, um, making sure that we are ready to be convinced by someone who has um, the opposing view from ourselves. Uh, and there, I mean, Netflix is sort of a unifying platform because, you know, we all see the same uh, shows and essentially we, we, we learn from, uh, you know, other, uh, other stories being told and we understand that maybe there's some core values that are, um, that we share as part of, uh, of humanity, but, you know, that's not true about, you know, other uh, social uh, uh, platforms uh, and, uh, and the fact that now we have a, a political debate which um, is very much driven by echo chambers where one is not uh, able to even listen at all to the other opinion and that we're rewarded uh, by, you know, sharing uh, uh, content uh, that is, uh, that essentially uh, is motivating uh, not the best emotions that we have as humans is a real problem um, uh, for, uh, for democracy uh, and it needs to be uh, addressed. I think Europe is probably moving faster than uh, the United States in addressing uh, these, uh, uh, these issues, but this is a real challenge. What started uh, as uh, a democratic revolution where anyone could um, express uh, their views without the need for moderators uh, and people who were controlling content uh, is turning into something that is, uh, uh, that is much, more, uh, much more dangerous. But at the end of the day, if, if, if young people really believe that uh, they can uh, uh, change things that they don't like, um, you know, go do it, and the way to do it is to participate uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the political discourse and also to contemplate uh, participating uh, uh, in, in the public sphere. One of the big problems that we have uh, is that uh, uh, there is so much spotlight uh, on, on, on public leaders that many talented young people don't want to go through the pain uh, of this sort of exposure. Uh, and this is a big problem. If you look at, you know, maybe one or two generations ago, the best and brightest uh, aspired to enter public service. I'm not sure that is, uh, that is the case um, uh, now. So we have to make uh, the case for making public service, again, more uh, attractive uh, to, uh, to young people. And that is why we have to address this, uh, this toxicity of the public debate, uh, which is uh, really, uh, in my mind, the, the biggest threat that uh, democracy is, uh, is, is facing today. But uh, the story of resilience, um, Athens um, uh, fought you know, in the Peloponnesian War, uh, essentially lost the war, democracy was uh, overturned, uh, an oligarchy was installed, but then democracy came back. Uh, and it came back stronger um, in, uh, in, in the fourth uh, uh, century and wiser, learning from its mistakes and with an incredible ability to self-correct. So democracies have that uh, ability to be resilient and to change uh, for the better. Wow, thank you. <laughs> thank you, that was incredible. And it, it brought me back to social studies. That was echoing, uh, echoes of Alexis de Tocqueville in there. <laughs> um, please, ladies and gentlemen, get, let's give a huge round of our applause to the Prime Minister and Ted Sarandon.